Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to Are You Accidentally Hypnotising Your Clients? Now, hypnosis is everywhere, but sometimes it's hidden in plain sight. Now, many years ago, before I studied therapeutic hypnosis, I thought hypnosis was just something that happened when a stage performer clicked his fingers or a therapist prompted a client to close your eyes and relax. But then I started to see that hypnosis happens all the time, and most commonly when people are scared, focused and emotional. Because hypnosis has to do with focus of attention. And of course, people, when they go to the doctors, okay, can be in a heightened state of focus and therefore more suggestible. Uh, it can happen during a shock at the scene of an accident where someone goes into a very different state of um, consciousness and things can seem dreamlike or to go into slow motion. Um, hypnosis invariably happens in all kinds of therapy rooms, whether the therapist knows that they're doing hypnosis or not. And the last point is really important. Clients can be hypnotically conditioned during counselling or coaching and depending on the way the practitioner communicates with their client. Now this is why I encourage all therapists to learn about hypnosis even if they aren't planning on delivering hypnotherapy themselves. Because there are certain types of hypnosis they may want to learn to avoid even if they don't feel confident enough to start using it uh, for good with their clients. Uh, because hypnosis happens anyway in therapy. It's an integral and inevitable part of the therapeutic uh, process. So three typical examples of accidental hypnosis in therapy. Hypnosis being a central part of human experience is therefore natural and therefore happens naturally and sometimes spontaneously. For example, uh, therapy clients can become focused and locked onto imagery or feelings. Okay. Um, sometimes it happens when a word triggers a flashback or ab reaction. Okay. Or when a client can't stop crying, they're, they're in a focused state of attention, okay, which is narrowed onto their emotionality and they may forget the room around them and it's, and it's an altered state of consciousness. When a client is locked into the past, perhaps by a line of questioning by the practitioner. So that, you know, the types of therapy where people may feel worse after the therapy because they've been encouraged to emote and focus on the past. Okay, it's a sort of hypnotic induction. And we're going to take a look at each of these in turn. But first, I just want to run through a quick definition of hypnosis. Okay, so what is hypnosis? Now, at the heart of hypnosis lies the experience of disassociation. Whenever we focus very tightly on one thing, we by necessity defocus on other elements of reality. In the deepest type of hypnosis trance, there is dreaming during sleep. We focus so completely on our internal Im imagery and dreamscapes that we almost completely disassociate from the bedroom or beach or wherever we happen to be snoozing and dreaming. Okay, so sleep time dreaming is a profound hypnotic trance in which you're disassociated from your reality. All strong emotions lock attention, make people more suggestible and cause disassociation to a lesser or greater extent. Okay. Strong emotions, especially fear, hypnotize people. And this can and does happen in therapy. During this state, people can learn very rapidly. However, the learning isn't cognitive, it's emotional. So here's what I mean. A word triggers a flashback or ab reaction. And we've seen this in, in, in clients where even hearing a word or seeing something will produce that. I've learned to tread carefully when discussing clients' traumatic experiences because ab reactions and flashbacks are actually deep open-eyed hypnotic states triggered by natural post-hypnotic suggestions. Okay, the trigger could be a word, a person, an object or a situation that as fast as the click of a finger of a stage hypnotist hypnotically regresses the person back to the original trauma. Okay, and until we've deconditioned the trauma, we need to tread gently around it if it's a very severe trauma. The original traumatic event sharply narrows the victim's focus, tipping them into a highly suggestible state of mind. Uh, in this state, their brain learns to associate fear 
with the event. Later, the smallest reminder of the traumatic situation triggers that same level of fear, okay, just like a post-hypnotic suggestion. This is a hypnotic and not a cognitive type of learning. You know, cognitive therapists try to get people to work out what they're thinking before a flashback and so forth, but it's quicker than the speed of thought, which is why getting someone to hypnotically relive a traumatic experience, once thought to be a suitable treatment that would discharge the trauma, has now been conclusively shown to make things worse. If a therapist does get a client to directly relive a terrible experience, then they're applying a negative hypnotic induction, which may be very harmful. So we should all be mindful that we don't accidentally trigger fear in a therapy session. Because it's not a good use of hypnosis, especially if the therapist doesn't fully understand the hypnotic nature of trauma or how to safely use hypnotic techniques to lift trauma comfortably. Example two, when a client can't stop crying. Shedding a few tears can be a release for a client but this isn't the same thing as not being able to stop crying. Okay. Remember, accidental hypnosis is a triggering of a state of disassociation. Just as dreaming at night is a profound disassociation from your environment. You forget about the house that you're in and everything else. During therapeutic hypnosis, we seek to deliberately engage the imagination, but this can also happen unintentionally when we become emotional. Unless clients are purely in the here and now, while in the therapy room, focused on the furnishings and so on, then they'll naturally begin to split their awareness. And the splitting of awareness is a key feature of hypnosis. So they might start to forget the therapy room as, as you ask them questions about their childhood. Okay, they're still aware they're in the, in the room, but they're focusing more on something else. The more powerfully they emote, the more suggestible they become within the limits of the type of trance that you've put them in through your questioning. And of course, if we get clients to emote in positive ways and help them build up their emotional resources, then we're using trance for good in an empowering way. But a chemo patient can feel nauseous just revisiting the place they'd received chemotherapy. Even now, they might be recovered. You know, the trigger can be very powerful. In the course of their treatment, they'll have built up an association between the building where they received the chemotherapy and even the people that were there and the highly unpleasant physical sensations that they endured there, the nausea, perhaps. So just walking into the building or even walking past the building, even if it has nothing to do with treatment anymore, can set off a post-hypnotic trigger that re-evokes nausea in the person to the point of vomiting. Okay, this is, this is something that's fairly common. Something similar can happen in therapy, especially when a therapist holds to the ideological view that clients need to get in touch with lots of painful feelings during therapy. If that's their ideology, then the person starts to associate that therapy room with crying and feeling terrible. So soon enough, just arriving in the therapy room could trigger the pattern match and just being there can make the person feel upset. Okay, and that's pure, that's a post-hypnotic suggestion or an anchor or a pattern match. The room itself becomes the trigger um, to suggest feeling bad to the person. The ideology of the practitioner might hold that this is healthy and should be encouraged. And so it continues. Now, it's great if your client has uh, a natural association to feel good and empowered and resourceful and relaxed and calm and humorous in your therapy room. Okay, but that sort of hypnotic effect will be happening somehow. Example three, when a client is locked in the past. Depression often causes an overfocus on the past, but also a biased view of that past. Depressing memories will be replayed readily and very easily, while more positive or neutral memories either get forgotten about or reinterpreted as having been actually depressing and not as good as you know they once seemed. Okay, so it's a re-writing um, of history in a sense. This is what depression does. Memories draw us inward, disassociating us from the present. You can be remembering something and forget that you're in the supermarket okay, for a few moments. Someone could be in the shopping mall, have, hear a piece of music that takes them back 20 years and momentarily forget the, the uh, mall or the people around them or the outrageous prices and become deeply inwardly absorbed.
They might even exhibit some classic trance indicators like glassy eyes, fixed stare, stillness of the body and so on as they're thinking about something from the past. And for, for a few moments they forget the surroundings. There's that disassociation, the spitting of awareness. During that time it would be relatively easy to induce deep hypnosis in such a per person because they've already begun the process naturally. Okay, so memory is as much a creative as a mechanical act of recall. We don't have tape recorders in our brains that are just replaying things as they happened. It's a creative act, which doesn't mean that we're not remembering real things, but we add to them and change them and alter them. And that's why excessive exploring the past in therapy may mean that a depressed client is tranced out and not necessarily in a good way for whole sessions at a time. And the therapist doesn't understand the role of naturally occurring hypnosis. A client who lives too much in the past may need help coming out of that particular uncontrolled way of trancing out. So what more subtle signs can you observe physically in your clients that indicate they might be naturally trancing out in your session? So I'm really talking about physical indicators that you can observe which show or display natural trance states in your clients. Other than obviously being more focused on inward experience than outer experience, as when a client cries or feels terrified of a memory, that may have occurred years before, there are more subtle signs. So one is fixed attentiveness, where the eyes become glassy and fixed, and you may observe rapid eye movement, or REM, uh, where the eyeballs twitch from side to side, even, even without the eyes being closed. Okay? Or you just find the eyes very, very locked and just starey. Okay? Just, they might be focused outward, okay, but they might be or, or appear to be focused outward, but focused inward. And this occurs when we dream at night, but also during hypnosis. You know, rapid eye movement we see in hypnosis as well as in dreaming people. When we ask a client a searching question, we're inviting them to narrow their focus inward, which is the beginning of trance. You know, if you ask them a question that's not easily answered, that could be almost like a prelude to trance. This may happen time and time again in a counselling session. So the key takeaways from this are five key hypnosis facts to understand. Hypnosis is a continuum. We can all be more or less hypnotized. It's not, it's not binary. It's not you are not hypnotized, you are hypnotized. It's a continuum. And the most deep hypnosis is usually the state of dreaming when we sleep because we totally believe in the reality of what, we're, what our imagination is producing. Next, hypnosis happens naturally, usually unrecognized within all psychological problem states. The focus of mind needs to narrow and disassociate for the problem state to be learned and later post-hypnotically reactivated again. Hypnotic learning tends to be unconscious, so the traumatized war veteran may not consciously expect to feel terrified at the sound of fire fireworks, for example, but suddenly realize that this is the response they learned during the original trauma. Post-traumatic stress disorder works just like a post-hypnotic command or trigger. Okay? Psychologically, there's no difference between the two. You can spot more subtle signs of spontaneous trance states in your clients by observing fixed attentiveness and or extended eye blinking, and also by the body becoming very still. When we're educated in the therapeutic and directed use of trance states, we can use them to help our clients in all kinds of amazing and powerful ways. So I've tried to give you a flavour here of how hypnosis happens, whether we know it or not. The more therapists can come to really understand hypnosis, how it's already operating, and how to actually harness this central human feature for the powerful and wonderful good it can bring, the more effectively we can help our clients. So I hope you found that useful, and if you did, please hit like and subscribe, and if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below this video. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And thanks for watching.